Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables, both for our guests right here in the room at Telecom Exchange NYC, as well as our viewers joining us on Periscope and on JSA TV. We'd also like to thank our Wi-Fi sponsor, Kelly Dry. Our fourth panel today is called Fiber in the City, Analyzing the Need for New Metro Dark Fiber Builds in and Around New York City. And that includes Jersey. <laughs> We're honored to have as our moderator, Mr. Richard Lukage. He's the Senior Managing Director and a founder of Bank Street, also a good friend. Richard brings more than 20 years of investment banking experience to the table and has originated, structured, and executed hundreds of deals, totaling over $100 billion of transaction value. Richard, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Well, thank you uh, for uh, assembling this wonderful event. It uh, just with each year seems to become an even more impressive uh, assembly and uh, very proud and honored to be uh, participating year after year um, as uh, a representative of Bank Street, although there are others here from Bank Street as well. Um, I was thinking about this panel earlier this morning and uh, uh, I was sort of struck specifically thinking about the New York City metro area. When I was at a, uh, my predecessor firm, we were thinking in the early days about how to create a private secure network between our uh, Park Avenue central office and our disaster recovery and data centers in Whippany and in, in Brooklyn. And at the time, we were talking about a first wave deployment of a 45 meg massive network that no one thought would ever be, um, uh, uh, I guess, it was future proof and never needs to be uh, touched again. Uh, needless to say, that was the beginning uh, of an era. And some of us at, uh, at the firm at the time uh, got on board and said, this is, this is very much the, uh, the beginning of a wave that uh, um, is, uh, is only going to uh, grow and, and provide opportunity in so many ways for people to participate. And uh, my colleagues and I have been very, very fortunate to, uh, to have played this now for more than two decades. And uh, collectively, actually, our firm's uh, professionals have touched well over half a trillion dollars of transactions uh, in this ecosystem across the globe. Um, I'm going to, I don't know any of these guys on the panel, so we're going to actually start off with uh, um, a bit of introductions. Uh, thank you, Jamie, first of all, for the kind uh, introduction of myself. Uh, but maybe if I could ask each of the panelists uh, to take a minute or two and describe yourselves and maybe uh, provide us a little bit of context on how you play uh, in the New York City metro ecosystem. Sure, sure thing, Rich. So, uh, well, first, uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity, Jamie, and um, thanks for moderating, Rich. So our, our, my name is Ray Lachance. I'm CEO of a company called ZenFi Networks. We're a, uh, you know, we call ourselves a startup. We're a two-year-old uh, company based here in New York City, focused on the fiber networking business. We, we uh, design, build, and operate a fiber infrastructure throughout the city of New York. We do have one span that goes over to New Jersey, but we're, we're clearly focused on New York City right now. And uh, we, it's our second go around in the fiber business. We, uh, we started with a company uh, back in the early 2000s called Lexan, ended up selling that to Light Tower in 2010. That business focused on building the traditional fiber optic infrastructure supporting enterprises. And, um, and creating, you know, you know, big looping networks to create resilient uh, and, and uh, networks we would term it called backhaul networks. When we started the new company two years ago, we, uh, we decided there was a new opportunity in this space. And the new company, ZenFi, is squarely focused on supporting the mobile wireless ecosystem and their, their desire and need to densify their network. So we, we are building a new type of network in the New York Metro, and it's called a front hall network. And that's really what our predominant focus is uh, with, with ZenFi. Cool. Uh, so I'm Cliff Kane. I'm the co-CEO of Clearion Fiber Networks, uh, also a New York City-based fiber provider. Uh, our focus is a little bit different than Ray's. We're looking to uh, assemble an ecosystem of the uh, uh, consisting of all the co-location facilities and all the resident uh, customers of those facilities, and extending that ecosystem out into you know, various enterprise buildings. Uh, we are focused on the the uh, real estate market as one of our verticals. Uh, we're also looking at uh, or, or focused on uh, being a carrier neutral provider and bringing back that whole idea of uh, carrier neutrality to uh, the New York City marketplace. 
Hi, uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Enzo Clemente. I am the CEO of Cross River Fiber. Uh, like these guys, we own and operate a metro fiber network, but it's uh, in New Jersey. Um, we have points of presence in New York through partnerships, but uh, effectively we, we own and operate a dark fiber and managed transport business uh, servicing you know, enterprise uh, customers alike. Um, we're excited. This is our fifth year doing this business, but there's a niche for the players that you see here, and we're looking forward to getting into the weeds a bit and talking a bit about what we do here. Well, the wonderful thing about uh, the panelists we have here today um, is that uh, some of them have actually played out in different iterations of the, uh, the fiber development uh, ecosystem. And I guess as I looked at some of the panels over the course of today's agenda, uh, I noted that uh, there were a number of posed questions as the, the thematic elements here about whether or not there's a shortage of fiber in the marketplace, whether or not there's an abundance or a glut of fiber in the marketplace. And since we have folks on this panel who certainly play in the colo to colo connectivity uh, sphere uh, in the data center to data center uh, enabling virtuality uh, sphere as well as uh, partnering with real estate and, and other uh, uh, interloping uh, uh, constituencies that actually, in many respects, depend on uh, their vitality being uh, enabled by your technologies. Maybe talk a little bit about or, or shed light on uh, the theme of do we have too much fiber or do we have too little fiber or, or how to best read that, uh, that debate? Start with you, Ray. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I love this question. I get it, I get this comment all the time. Like, why would you start a fiber company in New York City? There's a lot of fiber in New York. It's a it's a saturated market, and uh, there clearly is a lot of fiber. There's a lot of competition in the city, and if you look at a, an avenue like Sixth Avenue, I, I'm sure there's over 10,000 strands of fiber running up the the length of Sixth Avenue. Um, the problem is that most of that fiber is, is, is not as accessible as it needs to be to solve the problem of mobile densification, again, the problem we're focused on. So our, our, our thesis is that, yes, there's a lot of fiber. It's stranded. It's unavailable. It's not usable for this application. It, it goes past a lot of buildings, but it can't, you can't, it can't, access, it can't be accessed the way it needs to be accessed. So uh, we jumped back into the fiber business, but we didn't want to compete with the established, the, you know, the light tower models, the Zao models, and the other players in the market that had a, uh, you know, had a really established enterprise uh, business. We thought this opportunity to uh, build parallel fiber networks with huge capacity that was accessible in each and every block along the way was the, the network that needed to be built, and that's, that's really what we're focusing on. So, yes, there's a lot of fiber, but there's not enough for the applications that are coming down the road. Cliff, your thoughts on that? Sure, I, I definitely agree with that. There is a lot of fiber, uh, but it doesn't go everywhere you need it to go. It's, you know, echoing what Ray is saying, uh, our focus is not so much on the front hall, but uh, looking at all of these unserved buildings uh, that uh, there's tens of thousands of them in New York City which uh, have no fiber or have an incumbent fiber provider who uh, limits the choices for those tenants that are in, in that building. So we're trying to facilitate the ability for those tenants to have multiple choices of carriers and. You know, we're looking at a, a, a time where uh, coming where uh, you know people will be jumping from carrier to carrier uh, more readily uh, in the future. So we're trying to build an infrastructure that would accommodate that. Uh, and uh, you know, as as far as um, uh, the amount of fiber that is actually in the city t these days, it's, it's it, there is a lot, but there's going to be a lot more. There's uh, people are going to build and overbuild and overbuild for applications uh, that uh, we. We don't even know, may not even know what they are just yet. So I really expect a lot more fiber construction. And maybe Enzo, if you could take a slight, slightly different twist here and compare and contrast. I mean, obviously you come into New York or you feed out of New York and you're serving the New York metro area, but maybe talk a little bit about the differences you see uh, across the, the river here uh, versus maybe the experience that you see more in the metro core of New York City. Sure. I, I mean, I think densification is, is always an issue. Um, you know, you look at the turn of the century and the, uh, the marketable universe was much different. The consumers were much different than they are today. You talk about mobility and healthcare and the Internet of Things. So they're, they're different consumers. So with that, you talk about density. And with that, you rewind and you say, wow, you know, uh, 48 count was a big count in 2000. Well, you know, now I'm looking at an 864 and I'm thinking, should I put a 1728? You know, and we are. We're building that type of density. 
And with that density comes diversity, right? So, you know, it's one thing about, you know, going down a similar road or a similar path and saying, well, there's four providers on the one side of the street, but, you know, we take a, so often as a niche player, we take a, a road that's less traveled to, to provide optionality for, you know, our, the marketable or the addressable community for us. And, um, you know, as Ray had pointed to earlier, I think it is the evolution of mobility. Uh, and, and for us, we see it, uh, the evolution in healthcare, um, you know, a, a, a transverse from, you know, medical records uh, being, you know, from paper to a shift to, you know, electronic documents and HIPAA compliance and rules and regulations. So, you know, having dedicated dense networks with accessibility, um, you know, alleviating points of presence in certain POPs or, you know, legacy, you know, ILEC co-location centers, it's, it's what we're about. And when you're a startup and we're five, uh, you can do that. You can build effectively from the ground up, and we're, we're really, uh, you know, excited to be contributing to that. And I think, you know, a lot of the niche operators here, we contribute to this ecosystem, so it's an exciting time to be building fiber networks. So juxtaposing a bit the, uh, the 45 meg fiber pair uh, of the early 90s to, uh, uh, to today's new generation builds of 864 and 1728 uh, parallel builds, uh, um, do you see a scenario where after this wave of, uh, of uh, deployment in these right-of-ways around what's what we'll call Metro New York City that will be done? Or wh what do you see as the next, the next uh, wave of uh, construction activity? So I learned a long time ago to never say never, right? And done is a, is a, is a pretty infinite word. Um, no, I, I don't think we're done. I don't think by a, a strong, you know, uh, while we operate here collectively in New York and New Jersey, there's a national issue, right? I mean, you, you look out across the, 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 uh, the United States and there's pockets where that there's just no density. There's legacy, you know, ILEC and POTS lines that are providing services to, you know, commercial businesses. Uh, we're, we're not done. And, and, and to think that will we'll ever be done is, you know, foolish, I would think, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm going to want Ray to comment on this as well, but I'd like to specifically point out or have you comment on the, uh, uh, the topic of how much you're seeing in the way of dedicated uh, strands and capacity compared to what we kind of knew as a more lit world shared network environment of, of days of old and how much of that you see playing a role in the consumption aspects of new networks. Sure. So, so clearly some of the... Um some of the technologies today uh, enabling mobile. And let, let, me, let me step back for a second. We, we expect to see, you know, I've heard quotes from people at Verizon and AT&T uh, saying they expect over 100,000 cell sites in New York City. Today there's about two to 3,000 cell sites in New York City. And each one of those uh, serves a geographic region, maybe, um, you know, three block square in Manhattan, for instance. The, the reality is that, that the 100,000 antennas are going to pop up on every street corner. They're going to pop up on every floor of every office building, on, in the corners of those office buildings. T today, the technology supporting each of those antennas are dedicated fibers, right? We, there's, there's really no valid <clears throat> way to, to move the capacity to the edge, no, no, no viable way to move the capacity to the edge with, with traditional lit services like, like an Ethernet service. They do it with small cells and small pockets, but it's, it's a, that's a stopgap solution. And as we move to, um, uh, uh, you know, the Internet of Things, uh, you know, er, every vehicle is going to be connected to the network and every, everything that, every machine that you can imagine that, that has any technology that can be controlled remotely or monitored will be connected as, as part of the Internet of Things. That's going to require a massive infrastructure, and I believe it's a massive wireless infrastructure. But the wired wireless infrastructure requires wires, right? You can't make this work without a lot of capacity being pumped over to these edge antennas, and that's where the the fi direct fiber connectivity comes in. And whatever protocol lights it, whether it's Ethernet or there's a, a technology called SIPRI for digital radio over fiber, and there's met, you know there's other things coming down the road. It's going to require space, power, and connectivity, and it's going to require space everywhere you look. You know there should be an antenna in this room someday that's supporting just this group of users with capacity. It's going to be on all the 3,300 intersections in Manhattan. You're going to have capacity dropped off, and and that's that's a huge amount of uh, direct you know, strands of fiber that come back to centralized co-location or distributed co-location facilities. Makes sense. Maybe, Cliff, you can comment on how networks are being built today um, and uh, how that compares in terms of the ability to do drop-offs and uh, 
onboarding of capacity uh, to complement some of these vertical demand sets and, uh, and maybe talk a little bit about how you particularly target uh, verticals uh, that, that mo are most important to you. Well, it just uh, it would append a little bit to what Ray was saying. I mean, it's, it's going to take a, another step further because as these networks proliferate and densify, there's going to be a lot more uh, inter-exchange between them. Uh, there's going to be a lot more partnering. There's going to be a lot more uh, appearing. There's going to be uh, buying and selling across them. It's going to get very, very uh, dense and very granular at the same time. So that the ability to manage these networks and to deliver services for you know, for moments possibly uh, versus years uh, is going to come into play as, as, uh, as we construct these networks. And so far as, uh, you know, how we look at building networks, we're, we're really kind of a, a traditional builder. We, um, you know, we're looking at uh, a building network into, uh, or fiber network into a building to service those customers. But you know, on top of that, what we are in the, in the back of what we have is the uh, uh, the connectivity between all the co-location facilities, which enables those customers to reach any of the carriers or service providers or clouds or financial market services companies that reside that are, you know, within a cross-connect away from where we are. So effectively, we're not looking to to build these you know, uh, very dense networks like, uh, like Zenfi is doing where we're dropping off a pair at every intersection. Uh, it, you know, unless, of course, we're asked for that. I mean, we can certainly do that as a, uh, as a, a, a fiber provider in New York City. But, you know, our, where we're really looking at building is very similar to what's been, uh, you know, what the traditional methodologies of uh, building networks are. Great. Maybe, Enzo, if you could comment a little bit also about, you know, industry verticals. I know you spent some time uh, maybe with a, with a core focus and a few industry verticals. How do you see certain segments of the marketplace consuming bandwidth today versus perhaps other parts of the economy? Sure. I mean, you know, we, we started the company effectively um, looking at the financial community, high frequency traders, um, and really catering to, you know, a, a low latency application. Um, the evolution for us has effectively been content, uh, media, bandwidth, healthcare, uh, and, and backhaul wireless, which, you know, requires um, capacity. We, we continue to go back to uh, this, you know, this sort of statement here that you need a lot of this stuff and capacity will win the race. You need to have multiple strands of fiber. Our, our, our uh, users are not leasing a pair, they're leasing a bundle, 12, 24, 48 at times. So you have to have capacity and you have to have accessibility to the extent that they can access it uh, easier, um, you know, they're, they're going to want to build too uh, for the future. So, um, you know, we, we've seen a, a shift in evolution from the financial community to healthcare to mobility. Again, it's just sort of being a chameleon a bit, uh, you know, kind of catering to what our ca uh, customers are looking for, what they need, what their bandwidth needs are. Um, and I also continue to refer back to us being niche. So to the extent that we can continue to be niche and nimble and uh, customer service first, like all these guys here, um, we'll be able to react and, and satisfy those requirements. Uh, I'm going to want to come to the audience as well for questions because I see a lot of uh, uh, knowledge and experience in the, uh, in the audience that uh, might want to also pose a question or two. But before we go down that way, I'd like to, I know, Ray, you, you, you introduced earlier this concept of compatibility with, uh, let's call them the, the, the converging uh, spheres of wireless infrastructure, DAS, obviously, is an important component of that. Um, but I think also, as I think of the New York metro area, uh, the flow of undersea cable assets, uh, other uh, uh, wireless satellite other distribution technologies, all confluence around the New York metro area. Uh, not all of that necessarily in Manhattan, but uh, the, the compatibility of all of those ecosystems is something that uh, often people talk about their convergence, but how it actually plays out in the trenches, if you will. It, worthwhile maybe commenting on that and how you see yourselves each playing on that, uh, on that, on that continuing evolution, if you will. Sure. So, uh, well, well, first, when I look at, at networks, I, you know, I, I, from my perspective, you know, there are people categorize themselves as, as fiber providers, as lit service providers, as wireless, you know, fixed wireless uh, network providers, broadway, broadband providers. We're all network providers, right? And when I look at a network, um, all these technologies really need to, to, to converge and, and work together. So, um, you know, I envision a net, the network of the future is going to be a, certainly going to be a huge wireless component. I expect that uh, 
that even broadband into the home will ultimately be delivered with gigabit or multi-gigabit wireless connections from the last 100 feet, the last 50 feet. Um, so we'll have a wired infrastructure that gets close enough and then comes out with multi-point or uh, multi-point fixed wireless or non-line of sight uh, wireless or some, some technology that completes the circuit to many, many endpoints. So the, the, there's a clear convergence between wireless technologies uh, on the broadband distribution side and in the wireline side. As far as uh, y you know, New York City, obviously it's a, it's a center of uh, the universe from the US's perspective uh, with, with circuits terminating from all over the world. And they, get, and they reach out and touch endpoints starting at 111.8 or 60 Hudson, 32 FA, 3, 325 Hudson. Those, those are landing points that, uh, that have become uh, central to uh, distribution of, of high capacity coming from all over the world throughout. Uh, throughout the uh, city, so you know we're part of that, and and again, it's all it's connectivity, power, and space uh, is is the business that that we're all in uh, when we p provide underlying infrastructure. So we complete the, help complete those circuits. Cliff, uh, so what I would comment on is that the um, the the vision of uh, the, the connectivity of the future, you know, I think very similarly to uh, what Ray was just saying that the you're going to have a, a, a wireline delivery up to a point, and then it's going to go wireless to give you that flexibility. But what's happening in, in your cell phone even today is just is pretty intense. I mean, the you know the composition of uh, of a uh, uh, of a web page, for example, could be 50 or 100 different partners could be feeding into that. But you think about what do you have to do to deliver that kind of uh, service uh, on a very personalized and, and uh, timely relevant uh, basis? You know, for advertising, marketing messages. Uh, for for workflows for for businesses, I mean, this is this is where we're going with this. It's it's got the underlying infrastructure has to be able to accommodate uh, immediate, direct, uh, and highly localized, if not personalized, service delivery. Uh, so when we think about you know the the network, our network of the future, what we're laying the groundwork for is exactly that. It's got to be something that you know has enough capacity to get out there, but you know. And, you know, layering on things like SDN and NFE as the future, you know, brings those forward for us, then you'll have the, the ability to, uh, you know, the, to deliver, uh, I don't know, big data to, uh, to a cell phone or, or like you know, what Enzo was talking about, uh, it could be, you know, moving some uh, medical records around from a doctor who's walking down the street and he's looking at some, you know, imaging uh, of a patient or something like that. It's, it's really going to have to, you know, what does it take to build that kind of network? And, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, you know, currently we're, we're building a traditional infrastructure to service customers, but where is that going to wind up? You know, we see, you know, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot more uh, hosting and content moving towards the edge, which is going to require, you know, space and power near the edge. And then, you know, once you have that, then you, you wind up in a position where you can start delivering these types of services and maybe in a mesh configuration or what have you. But all of this is going to require enormous amounts more fiber, uh, you know, a lot more specialized uh, companies that are doing you know, anything from billing to provisioning, uh, to be able to keep track of this stuff on the fly. You know, there's a whole software layer component to it that you know, uh, we're not going to address in this panel, but I think it's equally relevant that's going to make the future happen for us. And so anything you want to add? Ditto. Uh, I mean, listen, <laughs> we're, we're physical fiber guys, right? So at the end of the day, we're often hidden behind the scenes while, you know, everybody outside of this audience probably doesn't know what we do for a living, but they're, you know, effectively we're enabling them to hit buttons on phones and tap on keys on computers. I mean, that's the sexy part about our business. No one ever mentions that, you know, we're, you know, um, I thought today I was going to be going on The Voice, but, you know, that's sexy, but this is kind of cool, too. I get to talk on a microphone. Rob said, what are you going to talk about today? And I said, you know, how do we bring, how do we make this exciting? Well, I mean, look at your phone, go on your Mac, and, and download some Netflix, and we're, we're part of that solution. I like to be part of that solution. I think that's pretty neat. I'm still having to evolve to the Mac, but yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess uh, maybe turning it, in the other direction a bit, what are the challenges for growth? I mean, I guess there's uh, um, the, the Moore's Law aspects of what's happening at the network layer, but you know, has anything really changed in the, in the sort of difficulties and complexities of actually deploying physical network on the one layer? I guess the other thing too, uh, speaking to the competitive realm is, we're talking to some of the 
uh, upstart innovators, if you will, in the New York metro area, but there's no shortage of capital being employed by, you know, the largest cable companies in the areas or the telcos and others. So talk a little bit about the, the, the headwinds as you look out into the horizon a bit, and maybe we'll start with Ray and work our way through. So, um, you know, when it, I, I got into the fiber business actually late, late compared to many of you in this uh, room in, in my career. But uh, in around 2002, 2003, I got involved with Lexant and uh, Lexant Metro Connect. And, uh, you know, we're building a fiber network. And, and w when I look back at the challenges that we had then and compare them to the challenges we have today, it's, uh, it, 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 uh, we had it easy. And I, I didn't realize how easy we had it. Uh, we had a lot of open duct capacity to get around the city. We had relatively low franchise fees to worry about. And we had a, uh, an environment that was, uh, uh, you know, building owners would, uh, you, know, you know, were much more open to us uh, building into the buildings and, and they, they didn't have their hands out. And it was, it was just an easier environment to build networks. Um, and I, we saw it get progressively harder up until, uh, you know, 2009, 2010. And, and I think things got much more difficult when Verizon Fios uh, came to town and started uh, really congesting the ducts. So, so what, what I see, the challenges I see today is uh, we have very little duct capacity left uh, in, in the city to uh, build new networks. Uh, we're, we're finding that the... Uh, the, the costs of doing business in the city because of the cost of being in carrier hotels for aggregation points or the costs of franchise fees, uh, the, the new franchise that we're, that we're, Cliff and I are under in the city is, uh, is, is really cost prohibitive. It's a, there's, there's, you know, the city makes the claim that they want uh, propagation of uh, pervasive, per, pervasive broadband throughout New York. They want the underserved areas served. But they've created a franchise fee model, which we pay per foot of cable that we put into the ground, and uh, so that, that limits speculation, right? You're not going to do, uh, you're not going to build a fiber footprint that ultimately is going to cost a few dollars per foot per year to just for the right to be in the public right of way. Speculatively, you're going to do that if you have anchor tenants. And the old model, which most of the franchisees are under, the Zayos and the Light Towers, and if they ha still have active whoever has active franchises that haven't expired, they pay a percent of revenue. That's a success-based model. That model, I think, is really uh, much more appropriate. And uh, so we have costs and congestion to deal with. The, you know, long story short, that, that's, that's what I see as the challenges for new entrants like Cliff and, and myself here in the city. Uh, Cliff, any other additional thoughts or challenges? Uh, yeah, so it's always about uh, capital uh, resources and what's available to you and what the market will bear. And so you, you face all those things. And I would just add that, you know, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the other incumbents are the larger competitors aren't faced with the same uh, franchise uh, costs that we are. Uh, and if they were, they, <laughs> if they would just be spending a lot of money with the city. Uh, we can you know, live in... Uh, and gold-plated buildings in the city because uh, they have so much fiber and they'd be paying so much money. But you know, it's you know, from our perspective, we we have to be very smart about how we deploy capital. And uh, what you wind up with is uh, there's a lot of demand uh, from the from the wireless uh, side of uh, of the world to to have this you know user experience, which is rich. Uh, uh, and um, you know, this is you know, forcing it. But then then the, you know, the the wireless guys have also started to pull back on their their capital deployments as well. So there's kind of like these gaps all the time where, you know, what's available for, for money to deploy systems and what's, what the, uh, uh, the service providers are really willing to pay. And you, you try to, to meet those gaps. But what I think one of the things that we're going to wind up doing as a solution to that, I think across the board, not just for Clearion, is that, you know, we would have to start sharing some resources. If it's a fiber network, whether it's, you know, people jumping off and on it, uh, you know, more cost effectively than now. But, you know, now I think everybody's kind of, like holding their fiefdoms and, and you know close their cards close to to their chest, uh, but I think you know it's got to open up because you know you know my customer maybe not the same as my competitor's customer and you know collectively we can swap uh, you know network assets and do things that uh, uh, that now the technology is is actually enabling a lot a lot uh, uh, to happen a lot easier. 
Thematically, that sounded like something called bandwidth trading earlier. Yeah, <laughs> it's all come back, Rich. You know, it's good stuff never leaves, right? And so. right. Enzo, any additional thoughts? And actually, I'm going to turn it to the audience for a question or two. As we, I think we only have another five minutes or so. Sure. I mean, yeah, we, we, we have different challenges than, than these folks here in New York. I mean, we, we effectively have to deal with regulation. And, uh, you know, people recognize New Jersey as being a relatively small, dense state, but in fact, there's 500 plus municipalities to which we traverse our network through. And, you know, effectively, you have to get rights of ways and agreements, which can be challenging because it's, it's all about time the market. When you're, when you're a small provider like us, our, co our customers want to see you show up. And so, uh, you know, what we do and what we've done since the uh, beginning of time here at Cross River is uh, done a lot of proactive planning, a lot of speculative engineering, you know, preserving rights to be in certain places at certain times. And, and I, we think that's, uh, again, back to being a niche provider, that's what we do. But, uh, you know, again, challenges, uh, time the market's a big one for us. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we have, you know, a lot of the capital constraints or burdens that these guys have with franchise fees, what have you, but uh, timing is a big deal for us. And so we, we, we proactively plan to get through those. Uh, you know, those process problems and challenges. Excellent. Uh, I, I guess I'll turn the floor to the audience if there's a question or two, and you don't have to spare me necessarily. These guys have been peppered uh, healthily here, and, and I'm happy to answer a question or two as well. But uh, anybody have anything you want to add to the uh, to the benefit of the uh, the assembly here? Bill, who's uh, new to the fiber space. <laughs> <laughs> You guys, uh, you guys have been very fortunate to be involved in this New York City project to deploy these pedestals all over the city. Could you uh, talk about the, uh, how that fits with your strategy and what some of the challenges of that project are? Yeah, so, so you know, I, I can't comment on the project specifically, but, uh, you know, we, we're, we're building a network that's, that's designed to deliver fiber to the curb to support small cell, DAS, remote radio heads, carrier Wi-Fi applications. To, so street furniture falls into that domain. Um, light poles, of course, we have our New York City mobile telecom franchise also, which allows us to deploy antenna locations and remotes on, at small cells or whatever on, on light poles. And we have to bring fiber to those locations. The way to do that is to create a network that's accessible, easily accessible along the entire fiber path. The traditional method of building networks, the backhaul networks that have a splice point that's a thousand feet away from your end node, if you have a node uh, that you have to get to every 200 feet or, or every couple hundred feet, a few hundred feet, you'll you'll have par you'll end up building parallel laterals back to a splice point. We've developed technologies to to really cut cost out of that, and, and we've created a uh, our front hall network is accessible in every manhole it goes through along the entire path. It's a very different model than the legacy networks that have been built. Uh, have, it's a different way of building the network. So what's that street furniture? <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of street furniture in New York that uh, eventually will host antennas. Um, you, you, there's, there's plenty of opportunity to plant antennas out there. So I am new to fiber, in fact, um, not really in fiber, wholesale wireless connectivity. And so we're at the end and talking about bringing it in that last 50 meters, as you said, and sort of the collaboration that happens at that side. And um, I did walk in a little bit late, so perhaps you addressed this question, my apologies. And perhaps I should know this. <laughs> um, but optimization, you know, we talk about, or we've been talking about today, fiber deficiency. And on, the, on our end, we talk a lot about optimizing the spectrum and spectrum management and that sort of case. Is there a piece of what you guys do as, as, the fi as fiber that has to do with optimization, or is that only something that can be addressed on top of the infrastructure? Yeah, I, I could answer. Go ahead, Don. Yeah. Let me add to that. So, so what we do is really critical to optimizing the, the networks and the, the carriers, you know, they, they have a problem with spectrum. They can't get additional spectrum, right? So what do they have to do? They have to look at that spectral reuse options. And the way they do that is they create more sectors. So you take a, a cell tower today that may have three sectors on it. What are the carriers doing? To increase, to double their capacity, they're creating six sectors. You take the same approach in the in, in the metro uh, along, you, you know, uh, up and down the avenues. They'll take those cell sites that are on top of buildings and serving three square blocks, and they'll put an antenna on every one of those those, those intersections and use that same spectrum 
at a lower power and create a smaller cell site. So that, that we're a critical piece of the puzzle for, for, for optimizing uh, the mobile network's uh, use of spectrum by helping them subdivide it. Really, really important. Right, I was just thinking that it's, it's about offloading spectrum. That's, you know, because spectrum is the, the, the capital expense that carriers face. That's one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive uh, asset in their, in their capex. So, you know, whenever you can offload it, either small cell, DAS, Wi-Fi, whichever way it's, it's coming off, it's good for them. You know. JP? Uh, my name is Luca Vecchios. I come from Europe. We own and operate uh, uh, fiber networks and submarine networks in, in, in Europe. My main question is, in five years' time, do you see the difference in, uh, in uh, sort of customer base that you have at the moment versus what it's going to be? And do you see any special verticals? business verticals uh, coming up and, and eating up this uh, past year's I think it's absolutely going to be different. I think we're going to get more towards, you know, internet type companies, uh, cloud type companies, media companies uh, will be using more fiber infrastructure, bandwidth infrastructure than they do now. Uh, just the, you know, the, the discussions down on the floor before it was, it was several times in the media was brought up about, you know, technologies that are able to push you know, media files through uh, from point to point a lot faster. Uh, so, you know, right now there's a lot of, uh, you know, our customer sets are carriers and enterprises. Uh, so businesses and, and carriers, are, I think, will continue to be, you know, a, a strong market for us. But I think it's going to expand you know, into a whole another level of, uh, of uh, users for us. Yeah. Well, I'll wind up by, uh, by saying that the, uh, the sort of capital availability and com competitive backdrop uh, uh, was commented on a few times, and I think it's been a rare circumstance in this ecosystem, which I've been proud to be part of for almost 25, 30 years now, um, where the confluence of capital availability and uh, the strategic appetite across so many interloping ecosystems uh, are all playing out at the same time. So. Uh, from that perspective, I think uh, there's there's lots of room for opportunity uh, to innovate and, and develop new themes, as well as to consolidate and actually play out uh, um, uh, exploitations of, of segments of the marketplace in a much more optimized way and, and opportunities for scaling as well. Uh, I think the, also the strategic interest across this ecosystem, uh, all of those converging arenas that we talked about, uh, you, you are reading about uh, playing out in the uh, in the headlines as, as Folks that were deemed to be traditionalists are new in the uh, uh, in the broadband arenas, and some of the some of the folks that you would not have thought of as uh, being very active in the space, you should expect to read about uh, in the months and year ahead. As uh, I think we'll see much more excitement across this uh, particular uh, particular space, and uh, happy to talk to any of you if uh, if you have any specific plans or ambitions as well. Thank you all for your attention, and uh, thank you for the panelists for a wonderful opportunity. Thanks. <laughs>